uh, with continuity here. Um, are, are we on air right now? Are we live? I guess we are. <coughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to our Halloween special. Um, I'm, I'm told that there's, there, we're, we're surrounded by ghosts and goblins and haunted houses, if you're watching us on Facebook. Um, uh, right now, if you can see me, I've, I've got a, uh, well, a former grad student behind me right now. Um, after pipetting for about a million times, he decided to kill himself with a pipetter. It's gone right through his heart. Um, but never to let anything go to waste, we had his flesh stripped, and now he's an articulated skeleton here at the Cambar Lab um, over at Cooper Union, uh, New York City. And I'm Dr. Oliver Medvick, and I will be presenting uh, today's or this evening's Journal Club. So uh, what will we be discussing uh, today for our spooky Halloween spectacular? Um, well, nothing to do with corpses, I'm afraid, but um, more papers on how to prevent ourselves from becoming a premature corpse. And a uh, paper that we're going to be discussing today, and I will share the screen, is a developmental cell paper. Uh, drug synergy slows aging and improves health span through IGF and SREBP lipid signaling um, from Admasu et al. And um, this is a really fascinating paper. Uh, I'll explain why in a few moments. Um, not least of which, I like how people are starting to incorporate the term health span um, instead of just lifespan. So that's what it's all about. We want to look at interventions that basically extend not only our lifespan, but uh, our usable lifespan to make ourselves healthier for as long as possible. So this paper here is all about uh, drug combinations. So we here um, at Leaf and Lifespan.io, we've, you know, we've talked a lot about various drug interventions. We've talked about metformin. We've talked about rapamycin. We've talked about all sorts of uh, drug molecules that could mimic um, mutations that are known to extend lifespan in model organisms and have a positive physiologic effect um, on organisms such as mice. And also data coming in um, suggesting that they can have a similar effect on humans. Uh, this paper takes it a step further, and um, they, take a, they take it a step further in combining drugs. And right now, really kind of the model for you know, most of pharma, especially big pharma, is you, know, you have one disease, one drug. And uh, you don't really hear too much about drug combinations and how they may actually work and ways that you can actually come up with sort of, um, you know, uh, smarter ways to figure out proper drug combinations. So these kind of poly, kind of polytherapeutic, poly, you know, compound approaches, uh, this paper suggests that this may be the way to go in that you can target overlapping pathways simultaneously and get a synergistic response. So either an additive or more than additive uh, response than you can from single drug interventions. Um, and we've seen these kind of drug combinations in, in other therapeutics before, uh, notably when you're trying to target viral infections or cancers. Um, these, you know, illnesses, these diseases uh, involve, uh, you know, organisms or, you know, viruses or cells that have gone haywire that accumulate mutations and you really want to target, uh, to target viral pathways um, all at once to kind of prevent one mutation getting a jump on the other. So, so um, this isn't, you know, the, this whole concept, you know, illnesses, these diseases novel and, uh, involve, you know, but, uh, you know uh, organisms being or, approached you know, to viral. aging or diseases of aging is somewhat novel. There's some papers, there's some work that's been done in the past, but not a whole lot. And what I like about this paper is that it suggests an approach that could be used to kind of winnow out uh, the possibilities of drugs because, you know, after you go from one compound to two compounds, uh, three compounds, right? Four compounds, five compounds, 10 compounds, and you've got a selection of compounds to use, you know, sifting through all the permutations of compounds that you can possibly take for the most, you know, efficacious combination will get astronomical really quickly. Uh, so they used a combination of approaches here in this paper to kind of winnow out what are the most likely drug combinations uh, that they can use to uh, get interventions that, as they show in this paper, um, closely mimic uh, what is seen with uh, point mutations, uh, genetic, you know, uh, uh, genetic alterations that you really can't re recapitulate if you're going to, you know, use a pharmacological therapy for humans. 
uh, they use these drug combinations to recapitulate um, mutations that are known to have a lifespan um, enhancing effect on a model organism. And the model organism that they choose uh, that's used extensively in biogerontology is C. elegans. And one of the reasons they C. elegans is used, most of you know, is, uh, well, it's not only its entire genome has been sequenced, uh, every cell has been mapped as far as developmental pathways are concerned. Um, it's a very well-studied model organism, but it also has a fairly relatively short lifespan, right? And it breeds like crazy, so you can basically test tons of interventions on this organism. Um, and later in the paper, they also um, kind of, you know, go in a little bit into Drosophila to see if these combinations work in a different species. Uh, so that's kind of a summary of the paper. Um, I'm going to just kind of pause here, take a breather, and kind of before I click to the paper. Uh, any questions that may have popped up? Probably not. So I'm going to go start sharing the screen here. Okay, so right, right, at, uh, right from the get-go, uh, this is the cover of the paper. Uh, they list several pathways here and potential drug synergies. Um, I don't think they mention here, uh, so, they, they, so they mention the uh, IGF, uh, insulin, uh, insulin and insulin-like growth factor signaling pathway, the mTOR pathway, which, which is uh, you know, targeted by rapamycin, um, and showing overlap between these pathways, especially downstream. And they're going to look at a number of different drugs and how they can potentially target kind of multiple components. Uh, they do mention, um, they do mention uh, TGF-beta, um, which um, is not shown here for some reason. Um, I don't think it is. Uh, I believe that's uh, encoded by the C. elegans homolog DAP7. Um, so all of these words here, DAF28, DAF2, DAF7, you know, DAF16, these are all mutants that are found in. These are all, I think, uh, dour mutants that are been, have been pulled out of uh, screens for C. elegans. And they have you know, their anal uh, homologs in, in um, other organisms as well. Uh, okay, so what do they do? So we'll scroll here. Let's heavily annotated paper. I've been playing with different highlighters here. Um, so this paper goes, you know, uh, kind of very straightforward from figure one through figure seven. Um, kind of in a way, I'd like to start with figure seven rather than figure one, but I'll start with figure one. Uh, and the reason they start with figure one is, you know, this is kind of the proper way to do this. Um, they test single drugs. And in, and, and, you know, a lot of these drugs, rapamycin and rifampicin, uh, which is actually an um, antibiotic, I believe, metformin, uh, sorafor, I'll have to check what it does, allantoin, um, they, they are known to extend lifespan individually in C. elegans and other organisms. Um, so why do they repeat this? Well, um, they mentioned right, right off the bat in the paper that, you know, they looked through a whole bunch of other drugs and uh, they did a, you know, they did a, uh, a controlled blinded study with these drugs in their lab. And the issue with doing lifespan assays, it's, it tends to be very difficult at times to replicate results consistently. Um, and that's because there's could be a lot of, um, you know, um, nothing to do really with shenanigans as much as it is with operator kind of error and different ways that people treat the organisms, you know, and the, these experiments last for 40 or more days and you're poking, you know, the worms. Um, and, you know, and you also, not to mention all the variables of where you get the drugs and, you know, how you prep the media every day. So on and on and on, there's, there's many very variables that can kind of, um, you know, make it really difficult, uh, especially in aging research, to kind of cross compare results. You know, when you say something has a 5% you know, increase and somebody else sees a 20% increase, you know, what exactly is going on is difficult. So they, you know, in their lab, they wanted to kind of lay the groundwork and, you know, do experiments and pick individual drugs that uh, they were able to consistently reproducibly get um, basically good data and, and show that they work. And, you know, and so this is not really a big surprising figure. They basically try to optimize the dosages. So here for rapamycin, you can see the optimal dose is the 100 micromolar concentration. This is percent survival of worms, probably done by somebody poking worms. Literally, that's what you do. You poke them, and if they stop moving, they're dead. Um, 
and I believe that's the, the assay they've, they've done, unless they automated it somehow, which they, they may have. Um, you can, and I've, I've seen automated versions of these assays, but um, anyway, so this is the link, these are days. So chronological, you know, lifespan of these worms. And these dips basically indicate how many are not moving after a certain period of time. So you have your control uh, worm, these wild type N2 worms, um, and 100 micromolar is optimal. Some, in some doses, is, some dosages, you know, too much is not so good. So rifampicin, too much is, you know, not really having much of an effect. So 50 micromolar appears to be the optimal dose here, and so on and so forth. So they were able to optimize the doses for both mean um, lifespan extension and in, I uh, believe in every case here, also maximal lifespan extension. So you can see a considerable extension and then you have a graph, let me see if I can get my face out of here, a graph basically showing, um, you know, the mean lifespan and the differences and, you know, asterisks here showing uh, a significance in, uh, in extension by these compounds that they picked uh, and we'll, go into why they pick these compounds in a moment. Um, but suffice it to say, after, after kind of looking through um, a list of different compounds, one of the reasons, one of the reasons they picked them is that they were able to get consistent, uh, reliable data from these single compounds. Um, the other reason that they picked these uh, compounds is um, I'm going to kind of look at my highlights here. Um, but they essentially look through databases, right? So they wanted compounds that can target multiple pathways and kind of have, you know, some, in some cases overlap and in some cases, you know, minimal overlap. Uh, so they looked at gene expression signatures. So they did, oh, so now I'm scrolling down to figure two. And this is kind of really the other main reason, the kind of the less trivial reason why they pick these compounds other than, you know, being, uh, reproducibly effective in their work um, is that they had these various transcriptome protocol, uh, uh, these uh, profiles. Um, so they did a variety of st statistical analyses on these, these three-dimensional PCA plots based on degree of, ex uh, of expression, um, uh, differential, you know, transcriptome expression. Um, this is this sort of circle plot here that shows connectivity, you know, regarding transcriptomes and the effects that you would see with these different compounds. And you can't really see it here. Um, all these lines would basically indicate different genes that are turned on and connections between other treatments. Uh, so you have uh, Sora, another drug, rapamycin, rifampicin, uh, metformin, allantoin. So some of these drugs had a very, you know, they didn't have a very broad transcriptome change versus uh, wild type. Other ones had a much broader uh, change of, of genes. And here as a kind of a positive control, you have this EAT2 uh, mutant, which is basically a mutant worm that recapitulates calorie restriction. And I believe this EAT2 mutation kind of makes the pharynx defective. So the worms um, have a difficult time actually eating. So they basically, um, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah. So they basically munch less. So they, you know, um, I don't know what the advantage of using an eat two worm versus just not feeding them as many bacteria, but um, I guess there is maybe some advantage. You don't have to worry about how much bacteria are in the plate if they're already, um, and it's been well studied. So, so that's, that's their control. And based on these transcriptome analyses, you can then cluster genes and show basically, you know, how much um, overlap there is with various transcriptomes, how much basically, um, you know, how these uh, treatments cluster. Um, rapamycin and rifampicin, for example, um, both have you know, not much overlap with their transcriptomes and uh, of their expression profiles. Allantoin quite a bit more with metformin, so on and so forth. C, you basically look at a Venn diagram of lifespan extending gen age genes affected by each drug. So there's a database gen age uh, that's uh, set up by, um, I believe his name is DeMigalis. He used to work at the uh, church lab, and there's a database where he basically annotates. Uh, it's, uh, you should check it out. It's basically a comparative database of genes that affect longevity in many different species. Um, and there's a database of genes that are known to you know, affect longevity and lifespan. And this is sort of a Venn diagram overlap of these different treatments and which genes they have in common, right? So 
rifampicin would have, you know, would target 98 genes, three of which, uh, three of which also overlap with metformin, for example, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is just kind of, so these analyses uh, kind of enable you to kind of tease apart these pathways and say, huh, you know, um, maybe if I'm going to be looking for drug combinations, maybe I can target uh, drug combinations that uh, have minimal overlap to try to hit pathways that are, you know, um, maybe not completely orthologous to one another, but, you know, certainly, um, you know, that would hint that you would have a synergistic effect rather than targeting the same pathway, you know, upstream and downstream where you might not see an additive approach. Uh, so they, they, took a, they took a pretty intelligent approach to um, try to come up with, you know, which combinations they thought would be effective because otherwise, you know, um, you could certainly try to brute force it, uh, but, uh, you know, if you have limited resources and a limited lab and not some giant machine that's going to be doing billions of different combinations, this is probably uh, the smart way to go. So I'm going to stop sharing and, you know, before we go into the, uh, you know, some of the preliminary results that they have with uh, double and triple drug combinations. All right. So. This is the bit where I always forget where the unmute button is because we use so many different um, comms programs. They're all got different buttons in different places. So I always forget. Um, so there we go. Interesting stuff so far, right? And if anybody's got any questions, uh, you know, do feel free to uh, ask in the chat. We've had nothing yet. We've had lots of comments about the Halloween uh, decorations, though. Uh, Oliver, Oliver can't see them. Uh, we can't see them ourselves. Only I can see them because I'm looking at the um, the comments in Facebook. But Oliver, you've got a. Let me just briefly describe it. You have lots of spiders and all sorts of things, ghosts, glowing pumpkins, all sorts of things going on there around you. Around me, so they're not entering my domicile. They, I have a, I have a magic circle around me keeping all the evil away. <laughs> I've got a spider that's dangling over the edge, really, above oh. my head. Okay. Why is it always spiders? It's, a, it's over your head now. Hmm. Um, but that's about it. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, Halloween creepiness uh, thing, creepy things going on. But it's kind of cool, you know. Um, See. We thought we'd try a new look and, uh, and and jazz things up a bit, and I think we've pretty much achieved that. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the Christmas one looks like. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, Santa Claus, reindeer. Yeah, that kind of thing, that kind of thing. But Lepre um, Leprechaun, no, not leprechauns. They are green, though. No, no they wear green. Yeah. No, I'm mixing up all my, yeah, no, no, never mind. Maybe if we do one for St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm that, thinking that of I'm thinking of elves. They are related to elves, right? They're mythical creatures. Hmm. Yeah. They are, actually. But, uh, yes, we had no questions so far. Um, okay. Uh, and I believe uh, elves and leprechauns are probably very long-lived, too. So, apropos. Yes, they're probably negligibly uh, senescent. Has anyone ever done a study on that? Or, you know... I don't know. I know. Yeah, hobbits live a long time, right? Aren't elves supposed to be immortal? I'll give Elrond a call. Yeah, I'll give him a call. Okay, very good. And uh, see see if he'll uh, if he'll send us some volunteers. That'll be interesting. A study, a study, a longitudinal study of uh, longevity in elves. A Lord of the Rings uh, study. Yeah, we can tease apart what's the genetic component, maybe what, what's uh, what's an environmental component. Is there something special to the elven diet? So, okay, that's uh, mark, mark that down. That's a, that's a theme that we should do later. I'll make, I'll make a note of that. Although, <laughs> joking aside, I do often uh, speak about uh, the elves in terms of uh, biological immortality, uh, which is negligible senescence, because I understand that in Tolkien's world, whilst elves could die... Um, they were effectively biologically immortal. In other words, they didn't succumb to aging, as do a number of species on our own world. So some some other species get all the breaks, right? We've got to fix all the things that are broken. 
So basically, one way to sell what we're doing, our research to the public, is next time people ask what I'm doing is I'm basically trying to turn people into elves. Yeah, and if you do, and if you do decide to become a, a hero, one of our monthly patrons, perhaps we should give um, a pair of pointy ears away. Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, you, I'll run it by Keith. <laughs> okay, so excellent. Now I have something to say in cocktail parties rather than. I'll just the compressed version is I want to turn people into elves and then just walk away. And if they bite, I can I can expand on it, but that'll be that'll be that that'll be the only thing I, I say. That's it. And uh, we have a question. Uh, Elena asks, what potential gerapet protectors should not be mixed in one super pill for humans? What are the principles of mutual exclusion of gerapet protectors? I'll uh, I'll put this in the text on on the uh, on Zoom there, so you yeah. Can, I don't can... I don't I mean I don't know I, I I know in this paper they they looked at combinations that certainly did not have an effect, right? Um, mm. I don't I don't think there was anything. We can take a look again in this paper, um, I, and certainly uh, I could refresh myself. I don't think other than you know. Um, so if the, if the dosages were wrong, either too low or too high, obviously they didn't work. Um, certainly for some drugs, we already know that too high doses, dosages would be bad, right? Certainly things that are, you know, I mean, analytics, but most, most drugs in general. Um, combinations that are optimal individually, but toxic together, I don't know if they've actually in this paper, they've shown that. So I don't know. Um, if anybody's demonstrated such a toxicity where you have individual drugs that are good, but in combination, they are bad. Certainly, in combination, they don't do anything or, or much, but you know, having a negative or deleterious effect, um, I might reverse myself if there's a graph that shows this, but I don't recall that being in this paper. And I don't know if anyone's ever shown that. So that's a, very, that's a pretty good question. Um, there's certainly nothing, you know, there's certain, certainly could be possibly that, you know, I could, I can imagine a situation like that arising, but I don't know experimentally if anyone has, has shown that. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the yeah. potential, uh, bad synergies could be something like rapamycin, uh, for example, which is, uh, which suppresses the immune system in, in large amounts and perhaps analytics because yeah. you really need your immune system revved yeah. up yeah so you wouldn't really want to suppress it so yeah but again we know i don't nobody's really shown that the, the only thing i can kind of think about is something a little bit more trivial and that these pathways are not like even in this paper where they try to separate these two the, the transcript don't there is some overlap with even the transcript don't profile so these pathways aren't completely orthologous meaning they're not completely independent 100 percent independent so one drug that's targeting one pathway and drug targeting another pathway, there still could be some overlap. It could still partly be targeting one of the other pathways and, you know, and having two might have too much of an effect on, on one pathway. Um, but again, I, I don't know if that was actually shown. So um, that's a good question. It'd be interesting to kind of see what the pitfalls are with these combination therapies. But um, again, um, that sort of negative deleterious effect versus just no effect, which they actually did see in the paper. You know, you had some drug combinations that um, did not synergize, even though the individual ones work pretty well. Um, they, you know, that was, you know, that was certainly the effect um, that they've noticed in some combinations in the paper, but um, I don't think there was one that was deleterious, but uh, we, we'll, we'll see, so. so. Let me share the screen here. Go back to this paper. Um, okay, so that's kind of their methodology. Um, so kind of a um, you know a rational approach to um, you know this rational approach to drug design, and now we have rational approach to drug combination, you know, searching so um, or screening. So um, very good. So uh, so based on these analyses, they picked combinations um, that are part, partly orthologous but not fully. Um, and they, and then they had some that were, you know, definitely had a lot of overlap. So, you know, obviously something like Alan Tone and Metformin would have a lot of overlap. And uh, so here we see, uh, you know, a controlled and positive controls. 
which are the, and the, these uh, drug combinations are the optimal doses that were, you know, found in the, you know, when they initially did the, the, um, their initial run with individual compounds. And that may seem boring to some, like, oh God, you got to repeat this, like, you know, to find, but like I said, it's important. Um, it really is because um, you, you, you can't afford to be really sloppy in this research because every operator, every experimenter, every technician is different. So you kind of have to establish your own baseline um, you know, when you're doing these experiments, uh, to, to see what sort of curves you will be generating. And it's always good to blind these as well. Um, although, you know, you can't really totally blind yourself to these experiments because, because, you know, if there's a noticeable effect halfway through the experiment, you're going to be seeing it. Right. So it's sort of like, all right. So anyway, um, for a variety of reasons, these experiments are, you know, hard to do. Um, so uh, what do we see in uh, figure D, um, E and F and the rest? Um, so uh, let me scroll to the text because there's a lot of drugs here and I just kind of want to um, kind of summarize what they said and then we can take a look at the figure and see if that matches what, what, uh, what the figure shows. So gene expression signature of single drug treatments. Okay, we already covered that. Uh, da, 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 confer analysis, uh, figure two. Um, uh, we found that no gene age gene was shared by all five genes. Okay, we saw that, and that each drug had a unique subset. So again, this is the analyses that they've done. So let's go to the actual curves. Um, so then they discuss synergy here. So before we take a look at the curves, I, I kind of want to yeah, break down their definition of synergy because there are like, there's synergy classic and then there's synergy light, right? And then there's synergy, some other synergy. So what does synergy actually mean? Um, so they, they evaluated these drug pairs. Um, so, uh, so they mentioned the combination reasons. So they'll, I'll explain why they did the rationale. They first test interactions between MET and RAP because of translational interest. Translational just means that, you know, um, these are things that people are interested in taking. Um, and they define synergy as, so just on effect alone. So the classic definition is that synergy may be defined as situations where the effect size of combination treatment is larger than the sum of individual lifespan effects some larger than its parts, right? So one plus one equals 2.5. That's synergy, right? In the kind of classic sense. Um, but then they have this other model um, that they cite Boris et al. where, okay, that's really a stringent qualification. If you're looking for lifespan extension, you know, um, maybe an additive effect is, you know, you have two parallel pathways and that is, you know, so I don't know why you would call that synergy and then just call it additive, but anyway, they, they just kind of go with this kind of a little bit looser definition. So according to this higher single activity model, um, drug combinations are considered synergistic if the combinatorial effect is significantly larger than the largest effect of any of the single drugs. So that kind of puts it the other way. So if one plus, if one, plus one equals 1 1.5, that's synergistic according to the HSA model right, versus just one or the other, which is a one. Um, you know, it kind of gets mathematically a little weird there, but there, there you have it. Um, and then they have another definition of synergy, which for all intents and purposes might be useful for when they screen for different combinations of drugs to kind of tease out, out of a pool of, you know, maybe hundreds of different drug candidates, you know, which ones may interact. And that is, Synergy can be defined as a beneficial interaction based on a mechanism where the whole is different from the sum of its parts. Um, so in other words, a qualitative difference. So, you know, you, you have, you know, if you have a, a, a transcriptome that looks, you know, uh, that's turning on, you know, one subset of genes based on rapamycin and you have a transcriptome turning on another subset, a completely different subset of genes, you know, maybe some other, a little bit of over, or some overlap with uh, metformin, combining the two is not just having a combined transcriptome, um, but it's a different transcriptome, 
there's some things that should have been up but are now down, right? So it's a qualitatively different transcriptome. So that might mean that there's some hidden um, crosstalk happening between these pathways that you might not have been aware of, and that kind of um, deserves further attention uh, when you're trying to choose between which drugs uh, to use. Um, so these are kind of, you know, all the definitions. So for their kind of practical application of synergy in their lifespan curves, they're really kind of referring to this higher single activity model where you basically have, um, you know, a, an effect that is greater than, uh, than the highest effect seen with an individual component, right? So again, one plus one equals anything above one is synergy versus your classic synergy, which you're really stringent. One plus one has to be greater than two. Um, okay, so based on that and based on, on, on kind of what they looked at, you know, they, and the rationale, they, they looked at combinations of uh, rapamycin and metformin and also combinations of, of other uh, drugs that kind of either are transcriptomes are overlaying with rapamycin or, you know, or not. So, so using this definition of this higher single activity model, we identify two potentially synergistic drug pairs, rifampicin combined with either rapamycin or Sora. Um, and then they say of the remaining eight combinations, four extended mean lifespan only as much as their better constituent drug, while none of the, ah, okay, while none of the drug combinations were toxic. There you go. So, um, so they didn't see an additive toxic effect. Um, and the remaining four combinations did not result in significant mean lifespan extensions. So, you know, you either get a no effect or you get a, this higher single activity model effect, which they're calling, you know, kind of, I'll say synergy light, um, but still um, a significant, you know, extension more than you would see with just a single drug, but no, you know, so fortunately no toxic effects. Uh, so we can take a look at this data here. So we have rapamycin. Uh, so this purple line here is, you know, so this black line is your control, um, which is just a wild type. And your purple is your 50 micromolar rifampicin with 100 micromolar rapamycin. So you can see that this is already more than just rifampicin, which is 50 micromolar or more than rapamycin, which is blue. So you do have a, an extension. Um, again, not, not a synergy extension that you would kind of classically associate. It's not a multiplicative effect. Um, it's slightly an additive effect, but definitely more than individual drugs. So, and, and, that's, and that's significant. So, you know, that is a big deal. So that's not to kind of scoff at it and say, oh, well, it's not synergy, you know, times 10. Um, you know, uh, for the lifespan and the health span of an organism, this, this really matters. So here we have another combination of rifampicin and Sora, um, where you see an effect uh, with 50 micromolar RIF and 100 micromolar uh, Sora, and these are lower concentrations, not as effective. And again, individual drugs. So these combinations are, um, are going to be effective. Uh, I believe for rapamycin in combination, they didn't see a mean lifespan, but they did see a um, maximal lifespan extension, which is interesting. I don't know, you know exactly how to interpret that, but they do mention that, that the, the maximal lifespan goes up. Um, but you, you know, and more so, obviously, significantly, if you look down here, than individuals. Um, and then looking, then this is just a plot that basically looks at... Um, uh, DEG stands for a degree of, uh, I highlighted this, um, degree of uh, differential expression of genes. Yeah, okay, there you go. So kind of a, a differential transcriptome analysis. And uh, so basically how many of these kind of, um, so the purple I believe is the amount of genes that, so percentage of differentially expressed genes that are unique or common for each drugs. So unique genes are genes that are impacted by one drug only. Um, versus common genes are affected by at least two different drugs. So you can see this compound allantoin is, has a lot of unique hits versus there's a lot of overlap with these compounds here. So that kind of led to their idea to uh, start introducing a compound that has a lot of unique, uh, unique targets in combination with, you know, 
uh, rifampicin and Sora and rapamycin uh, and see if they get a further effect because now you're looking at a pathway that has, um, is targeting more unique pathways. So this is their transcriptome analysis. And you know, their prediction would be that you know, um, they would see uh, an added, you know, a synergistic you know, HSA model definition of synergistic effect, additive effect, if you add this extra compound uh, again, based on this, uh, you know, based on this uh, uh, transcriptome analysis of differentially expressed genes, and I believe that's what they see. So this is now their triple drug combination. So we have control, which is black, um, and you see a nice difference already um, between everything else. But you have individual drug combination uh, drugs. So rifampicin blue, allantoin by itself. Um, you know, pretty significant, right? Not, you know, crazy good, but pretty, pretty significant. And Sora, so all of these are kind of falling here. And then Rif and Sora are here. And then adding in this allantoin, you do get um, a slight modest increase that, you know, is significant and a little extension here on their maximal lifespan. And then adding in, uh, I believe, rapamycin and rifampicin, uh, I believe you see the same effect when you add the allantoin as well. Um, so it kind of, you know, this, this starts to really validate their, their model or their approach here, you know, which is, which is um, very kind of a nice logical approach and kind of, I think, lays the groundwork for more systematic kind of uh, hunting for drug combinations because, um, you know, you see a lot of people taking, and, and this definitely, the reason, the one reason I like this paper, not just because it's laying the groundwork, um, there's been other papers that, you know, have looked at drug combinations, but, you know, here they're applying a, a very kind of multi-variegated bioinformatics approach to kind of, you know, um, rationally choose these combinations. Um, so it lays the groundwork for further hunts for, for small molecules. The fact that it's being applied for small molecules has uh, a lot of pharmacological significance because, you know, um, we've mentioned on these broadcasts here, and um, I'm of the opinion, I think we're of the opinion that these are sort of like the low hanging fruit when it comes to therapeutics, um, especially if you're going to be looking for compounds that are GRAS, GRAS, generally recognized as safe. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, knowing that there's compounds out there that are already effective, you know, and seeing here that validated in an experimental model organism that they can have a synergistic effect, um, that's pretty cool, right? Because, you know, there's, there's a lot of individual compounds that work, but uh, applying this to compounds that we already take as, as humans, um, you know, we take multivitamins, there's all sorts of things out there if you go to a drugstore. And, um, you know, what combinations work? Um, what combinations are effective? And um, when you start dealing with hundreds of different compounds, uh, you know, everything goes out the window. The numbers just get astronomical. So you have to have a systematic way uh, to test these combinations. Um, and this kind of nicely ties into, you know, a project that we funded in the past that is still ongoing, which um, I believe that's the, the, the major mouse study, right, uh, Steve? That where they're looking at combinations of drugs. Um, that can potentially synergize and apply basically what is being done here, but not with these compounds per se, but for other compounds and apply them to higher organisms such as mammals, mice. Um, so, um, you know, and for all those reasons, you know, that's, that's kind of why I chose, why I chose, the rationale why I chose this paper. So, we'll we are indeed, yeah, we are indeed um, testing uh, what we call cocktails, senolytic cocktails. We've got six senolytics that we're testing or potentially senolytic compounds. Yeah, some of them most people would have probably heard of by now, the usual suspects, but we've got some unusual ones as well. So, and we're testing those in twos, even threes, uh, Oliver. Hmm. So that's uh, interesting. So wait, where is this being tested? Who, what? Uh, MMTP. Oh, MTP. Okay, right, right, right. The combination of analytics, yeah. That's right. We're currently testing it in a secret location in Germany. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it is underway um, in, a, in a mouse house. 
a mouse house. That's what they call it, a mouse house. I've got visions of this gigantic mouse nest. But uh, it's somewhere somewhere in Germany. Somewhere. Okay, so in keeping with Halloween, it is a subterranean bunker, probably. Um, there, there might be a room where zombies are kept. We're not sure. We may, I may just be making this up. This just might be my feverish hallucination. But I like to imagine that there is a zombie wing as well as a mouse wing. I thought we weren't going to mention that. Um, yeah, um, we, 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 we do have a zombie mouse uh, wing. This, is, well. this, isn't, li this isn't live, right? We, we get to edit this before it goes out. Oh, dear. <laughs> Damn it. Whoops. I did it again. Sorry, Alexandra. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> and in keeping with Halloween, have you noticed I've got my skull mug as well? Look, cheers. Just keeping it real. Just keeping it real. That's right. Um, okay. Um, back to the paper. All right. So let's uh, share the screen here. All right. Where was I right here? Figure two, we go to figure three. Um, so here they're basically trying to, you know, again, um, there's a lot of stuff happening here. So I gotta constantly remind myself. Figure three, drug synergies extend the lifespan of E2, but not DAP7 mutants. And this is where they kind of um, uh, figure out based on their transcriptome analyses and, and see which genes are turned on. Um, you know, kind of tease apart further which pathways, you know, um, the, you know, which pathways are, you know, the extent of, you know, how orthologous they are. And that just means that word just means that how separate these pathways are. Um, and their correlation with um, calorie restriction. So E2, I mentioned, is a CR kind of mimetic mouse in that it has a, a you know, ability to not eat right. Right, so um, it doesn't munch on bacteria as readily. Something's wrong with its pharynx. Um, so, so there's not much. So it it turns out that you know that these aren't completely CR mimetics, which is you know good and interesting. So there's there's it's not just kind of mimicking calorie restriction, um, but they don't extend the lifespan of DAF7 mutants, which is interesting. And DAF7 is kind of the worm version of uh, of uh, TGF beta, which we discussed in the past, um, and I don't know—is that your—is that your favorite uh, protein there, Steve? TGF beta. Well, I like to mention that in your slide. And, uh, I'm going to say, funny. I'm just going to say that inside joke. In moderation, you like TGF beta. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You've got me. You may have caught me talking about TGF beta occasion there, and it's not my favorite one because I always talk about NF. KB more than that, which is the okay. nuclear factor kappa beta, which is the one that regulates TNF alpha and TGF beta, etc. So it's the it's the kingpin. But yeah, I do talk about TGF beta a lot, but you can blame Irina Conboy for that. Okay. So TGF beta, you know, um, again, uh, it's uh, you don't want too much of it. Um, because I believe uh, it could basically promote uh, senescence phenotypes, right? And uh, and basically they see that these pathways are uh, dependent on you know on TGF uh, beta because these DAF7 mutants basically are based mutations in the TGF beta pathway that's you know, that's uh, uh, analogous in in worms, right? So. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of just kind of skip these. Um, so again, this A and D are just again transcriptome analyses. D is top five pathways enriched in the set of downregulated genes of synergistic drug combinations, and I just mentioned here all synergistic combinations consistently enrich TGF beta, right? So there are these red lines, TGF beta signaling pathway, blah 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 blah. So all these drugs when they dump these drugs in there, um, this is the enrichment of. Uh, so when they say enriched. Um, they mean downregulated. So don't, you know, it, it's kind of, it was a little confusing for me at worst. First, I'm like, wait, wait, enrich? Wait, wait, what do you mean? It goes up? No, no, it goes down. It just means that the genes themselves, genes themselves that uh, 
um, that are in, involved either negatively or positively are enriched. And in this case, negatively, right? So bit of a weird uh, choice really then, isn't it? To go against the grain. I mean, the established is up and down regulated. Um, yeah. it's, it's a bit jarring really. Uh, TGF beta also um, immobilizes stem cells, by the way. It reduces the mobility of stem yeah. cells. So if you knock it down to a, a, a correct level, you end up getting um, better stem cell mobility, which means better tissue regeneration. So it's it's kind of good. You need it for like wound healing and stuff. It's just when it gets out of hand, it's all about balance. Yeah, all about balance. Oh, yes. Okay, so um, back to the balance of TGF beta. And there's a bunch of other interesting things there that, um, you know, uh, they don't really go into much detail here, but there's, there's glycan degradation, um, glycine serine three in metabolism, which goes down. Uh, anyway, um, so here is here's their basically their results. So N two again, this dotted line is your negative control. That's just your your wild type, and this is your E two. So um, so E two is your black line. So this is CR. So CR has so it's pretty impressive that these drugs work better, you know, than this, than your classical CR approach in your, you know, calorie restriction, um, significantly better. Um, here is again, your N2 and your E2 uh, mutant, which you get an extension um, in the background. Uh, so I believe this is your, well, this is a little confusing because this is E2, this is E2. So this is, this is going to be, so N2 is not in an E2 background. <laughs> N2 is your wild type that is not E2, if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, and this graph that says E, that says DAF7, this is a DAF7 mutant. And yeah, and this is your DAF7 mutant, and this is your, your wild type. So uh, yeah, OK, never mind. All right. I was just momentarily got sidetracked there by the terminology. So you have an extension here. You have an extension here. Um, individual drug combinations, and then this, uh, you know, uh, purple Rift Sora, uh, pretty impressive. Rift Sora, Alan Cohen, uh, red, again, pretty impressive. Green. So these are all triple drug combinations. So significantly more than your your CR. Um, individuals, some of them rapamycin, uh, doesn't look like it's really rapamycin doing much in the context of an E2 uh, mutant, right? So it looks like there's an overlay there. Um, if we look at E, your DAF7, so here is your black, um, rapamycin also not so much of an effect. Um, purple dash is Sora, so that's all. So basically you have some some effect if you add in this Allen Toen, right? This rap rift and Allen Toen, rift sore Allen Toen. But if you just have double combinations like rapamycin and rifampicin, you kind of, I think you abrogate that effect. So, so basically a DAF7, so a lot of these single and double drug combinations are dependent on DAF7. I think Allen Toen was the only one that you know, still had an added effect that did not appear to, that had, you know, appeared to be, and probably based also on the transcriptome analysis, didn't have, um, uh, didn't have, you know, as much overlay with the TGF beta pathway. So I wonder if they mentioned that in the effect here. So we found that only the TGF beta pathway was enriched on each synergistic, non-synergistic, non-synergistic combination showed no effect. TGF beta, we find that each of the synergistic combinations included the only pathway potentially. It's commonly exclusively enriched. And what else did they say? Do they TGF beta? On its own, only Rifampicin showed lifespan extension in DAF7 mutants. Oh, um, did that? Was that the case? Rifampicin. Uh, oh, yeah, Rifampicin does. So Rifampicin uh, is the only one that showed an extension. Um, 
So actually, no, there was no additive effect beyond rifampicin. So I had that little confused there. So I think rifampicin was probably the only one that didn't show in the transcriptome that had significant overlap with DAF7. And I think they mentioned that somewhere uh, in the paper. So my apologies there. Um, on its own, only RIF showed lifespan, all synergistic combination, also extend lifespan DAP. However, the effect size of the combination not significantly higher than RIF alone, meaning that none of the combinations resulted in synergy in DAP7 mutants. Um, so, you know, DAP7 being, uh, being important, um, you know, DAP7 being the TGF beta pathway important for these synergistic effects uh, uh, for these uh, drug uh, combinations. Uh, so next, they look at drug combinations and their effect on the IGF pathway. So insulin uh, growth factor pathway, insulin signaling pathway in worm, uh, that's where you get DAF2 and DAF16. DAF2, I believe, being upstream. I think that's the receptor uh, for DAF28, which is you know um, the IGF receptor and uh, the IGF ligand. And then DAF16 is the effector that's downstream. So they're all in the pathway for IGF signaling. And the effect of these, uh, the effect of these uh, drugs. Uh, again, they do an analysis here. I won't go through the string diagram here, but they basically look at uh, this network diagram of unique, trans again, transcriptional changes resulting from treatment with RIF and SORA. And they look at nodes are genes known to affect longevity and the transcriptome changes and kind of the degree of change that you get is obviously, you know, the size of these nodes. And I think that plays a role in the pathways that they wanted to look at, which is the IGF pathway, because I think those were enriched and they wanted to see how much overlap they can get with uh, these drug combinations uh, with regards to lifespan extension, right? So again, um, your negative control, just basically, I believe that's uh, wild type. This is in a, that's wild type. Uh, hold on a second. Control. No, it's not wild type. It's DAF2 mutant. Is that a DAF2 mutant? I think that's a DAF2 mutant. That is a DAF2 mutant. Yeah. So if we look at kind of the x-axis here, you can see that they're already living pretty long, right? So day zero to day 60, day zero to not so great for DAF16. Um, that's further downstream. Um, and they look at combinations. Uh, so interestingly, the biggest combination is with Sora. Uh, and I'm trying to, they mentioned a significant little tidbit here in the paper. I'm trying to see if I can pull it out of this uh, chart here. So Sora has a significant effect. Um, Interestingly, rifampicin and Sora, I don't know, I think they, they may have mentioned this in the paper why that's the case, that having rifampicin with Sora abrogates the effect of Sora, the drug. And I'm not really 100% sure why. Uh, all right, similarly, treatment with DAP2 mutants with either of the two Sora combinations showed no effect on lifespan, even though Sora alone significantly extended uh, significant lifespan. Life what is, so what was their reasoning behind that? Um, why, and again, there's not, it's not a deleterious effect. They're not living less, um, but I don't know why the combination of the two would um, kind of cancel each other out. Neither drugs alone shows evidence for significant inhibitory effect on IGF signaling. Synergistic combinations too. Further extended. RAP is known to extend lifespan and DAP2 mutants. In our hands, RAP alone and RAP based combinations all extended. However, the effect size were not significantly different from RAP alone. It's also worth uh, noting at this point that it all ties in with uh, the hallmark of aging deregulated nutrient sensing. Mm -hmm. uh, and IGF and insulin is part of the um, IGF-1 and insulin signaling pathway, which is one of the four main metabolic um, pathways. You've got two catabolic and yep. uh, two anabolic. And essentially, it's all consistent with uh, what we know about caloric restriction. And when you, when you uh, start caloric restriction, you're actually reducing the amount of IGF-1 um, and, and, and dropping your insulin, you know, it's, 
it helps you maintain a, a, a sort of steady, you know, sort of balance of it rather than spikes. And that seems also consistent with what they were uh, what they were uh, teaching at the Open Longevity School this summer in Russia, which was about a, uh, a diet that's based on um, low glycemic index. Like, um, you know, you don't touch uh, fast carbs like potatoes and things. You want complex carbs. And the aim is to keep the IGF and insulin levels steady and generally not too low, but low. And it's all associated with longevity. And that matches with, of course, nutrient sensing and the data here as well. You know, lower levels of IGF-1 equal longevity. It all ties in, really. Mm -hmm. And And they have, yeah. And, and uh, you know, these studies here, you know, again, um, this is research, so you tend to get some surprises and kind of one surprise that they mention here that's based on the figures that we're going over here, particularly figure D, which is the DAP16, which is further downstream. Um, and we'll take a look at these curves to see if it jives with, and I kind of highlighted this because it popped out at me. So when they look at the synergistic combination of RAP and RIF mycin, comprising one DAP, DAP16 dependent RIF and one DAP16 independent drug, right? So these are looking at them individually. So one of these is dependent on the DAP16, uh, you know, one DAP16 dependent, one DAP independent drugs. And even the rif sora combinations of two DAP16 dependent drugs still showed synergistic lifespan extension in DAP16. So basically their take home is surprising result shows that drug synergies can be DAP16 independent, even when their constituent drugs are individually DAP16 dependent. So meaning if you, let see if that jibes, if one or the other has no effect in a DAP16 background, combining the two might have an effect or will have an effect, right? So you would think from just a, so that kind of ties into their third approach and, and well, I guess this is kind of a, a uh, manifestation of the third definition of synergy, which is you get a qualitatively different approach that's additive, right? So you wouldn't expect that, right? If you have drug one has no effect and it's dependent on a pathway and drug two has no effect because it's dependent on the same pathway, combining them both when they're both dependent on the same pathway and that pathway isn't there, shouldn't have any effect, but it does. So suggesting that you probably have novel targets maybe somewhere that are, you know, that are, uh, you know, um, maybe operating parallel. And I don't know why the two drug combinations would work. So if we look at control, um, if we look at rifampicin, it's right there, kind of trailing the, you know, the control. Um, so what did they look at? RAP and Sora. Is there um, Sora is, yeah, Sora and and Riff are like right here. So not really not really a mean lifespan extension, or maybe you could see a slight. I don't know. It's well, not no, maybe if it's kind of really sketchy, but you know, really negligible, right? Effects, but combining the two, um, where you have Riff and Sora. Um, is a dramatic increase in the DAF-16 background, right? Which is already, um, you know, having some effect. So I don't really know what the explanation for that is. DAF-16 is way downstream of, you know, IGF signaling. Um, but, uh, but there you have it. Um, maybe somebody else can chime in as to why they think that's, that's the case. I haven't got a clue, um, but it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is very interesting. Um, it just goes to show what what weird uh, synergies and additive effects uh, are potentially out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but, you know, the classic example is to start a nib and quercetin, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty much the definitive. It's like you put them together, and and they suddenly do something. Unusual. Yeah. So, again, I, you know, that's, uh, you know, another reason why I like this paper. Again, it's just, you know, one model organism they're looking at. They kind of touch on Drosophila, and they have more in their supplemental. 
Um, they don't go really heavy duty into the Drosophila experiments. To sh and they basically mention at the end that there is some overlap with these effects. But again, you know, um, not, not as dramatic as what they saw with the worms. And that's understandable because they're looking at, you know, worm databases and they're, they're, they're really tailoring this drug cocktail combination for, for worms. But there's no reason why the same approach can't be, you know, applied to any other organism, right? We're all evolutionarily related. So, um, you know, not, not to kind of be overly optimistic, because again, this is just one model organism and a very small subset of drugs. But, you know, at the very least, what they looked at here is, is um, you know, you didn't see any unexpectedly toxic combinations, right? You saw either no effect, no synergy or synergy, right? You didn't see like, you know, put two compounds together and nerve nerve gas is created right so that's thanks so um so that's uh let me just add a package real quick um so that's you know that's positive um okay so i'm gonna kind of go back here um the remainder of the paper um kind of five and six is uh they look at um you know what are kind of what are other pathway components that these drugs may be regulating, what can be responsible for these lifespan extensions. Um, and I just highlighted some key phrases here. They found that the synergistic effects lifespan are dependent on both DAP2 and DAP7, only partially dependent on DAP16. And then you try to explain these observations. They wanted to look at further downstream effectors to be affected by both DAP2 and DAP7, which are upstream. Um, and one thing really downstream, um, you know, they, you know, they identified metabolic pathways, you know, part of these things that be enriched for differential expression of genes and, uh, and lipid metabolism was kind of a big thing. And one downstream um, important regulator is this SPD1, uh, which has a homolog in humans, is a master transcription factor controlling several lipogenic genes. Particularly, they mentioned these delta-9 P saturases responsible for MUFA synthesis, which is um, mono, uh, uh, mono unsaturated fatty acids, right? Not to be confused with MARFA, which is in Texas. The MARFA lights, UFOs, okay, never mind. MUFA synthesis, MUFA. You're getting MUFA. back into Halloween stuff again. Um, yeah. the, tru the truth is out there, I want to believe. All right, so we're talking about MUFA, <clears throat> monounsaturated fatty acids. And I didn't know this, but they mention, they cite a paper here. Um, oh, so why are they, so other than the fact that this is enriched in, you know, this type of expression, when they look at these, um, you know, mutations, these, uh, you know, these lipogenesis. Um, so before I go into the data, they also mentioned that um, given the importance of genes involved lipid, we tested whether treatment of synergistic drug combinations affected the lipid profiles of the membrane and storage lipids. Um, so, okay, so previous studies have found that long-lived C. elegans mutants and offspring of non-agerians had higher ratios of MUFAs to polyunsaturated fatty acids. And that is offspring of human nonagerians, so offspring of old lived parents. So I didn't know that, that there is a study out there, uh, Puka et al. 2008, where there's a correlation, I guess a biomarker, if you will, in offspring of older humans that have um, more of these monounsaturated fatty acids in their lipid profiles. I did not know that. So something we should take a look at. Um, and it's interesting that there's this correlation also, you know, big evolutionarily, evolutionary distance between C. elegans and humans, but it's interesting that such a seemingly esoteric, but I guess it shouldn't be esoteric. I mean, everything has plasma membranes, so it's a very fundamental, you know, fundamental thing, right? Um, for all life. So the fact that uh, lifespan can correlate with the lipid composition should not be, I guess, too surprising from that revolutionary perspective. But anyway, um, that's, what they, that's why they decided to look at um, genes that are regulated by this SPD1. And they're basically what will happen if you knock out these genes. So they look at RIF, Sora, Allen, and they saw that these drugs increase the expression of not just SPD1, also their downstream whatever you know, the downstream genes that regulate, which are these delta-9 desaturases, which are responsible for the formation of these MUFAs, FAT5, 
like these terms. Obviously, this was a screen, physiologic screen, FAT5, FAT6, and FAT7. So I guess that would, I guess the worms physiologically looked bloated. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, somebody decided to call them FAT5, FAT6, and FAT7. Maybe, maybe it was just, maybe not. Certainly when they name mutations in Drosophila, it's usually based on the physiology or the appearance of the fly, right? And that's why you get bizarre nomenclature that seemingly has no connection whatsoever to the underlying, um, the underlying genetic uh, pathway whatsoever. Things like 18-wheeler and pumpkin and cabbage and stuff like that. Um, I'll say an interesting anecdote here that I found out from doing a deep dive into Wikipedia. Um, do you know where the name rifampicin comes from? You think these drugs, you know, are logically named? Um, and, and, and I, don't, I don't, but then I've, I've been involved for too long, so I know that some of the I have, name. Yeah, I, I had... I don't even know what I was looking up rifampicin to find its structure, and obviously there, you know, it's got a wiki page and all this stuff. And then there was a reference to. <laughs> I gotta double check this, but anyway, whatever. It's Halloween, so if I spread misinformation, whatever, take it with a grain of salt. But uh, but you can you can double check it on your own. But supposedly the researchers discovered rifampicin in a soil bacteria that they isolated somewhere in the French Riviera, so they lived in France. And uh, this was in the late 1950s. And, um, and these researchers were quite fond of a um, French gangster movie called Rififi. That was the name of the gangster. So they were so fond of, fond of it that they decided to call the class of molecules that they pulled out of this bacteria after Rififi. And they called them Rifamycins. And that's where Rifampicin comes from. A, cheesy French gangster movie um, and uh, wouldn't that be fromage rather than uh, a cheesy if it's French fromage a fromage, fromage yes yeah if, if, sorry if, about it, that font it would be fondue yeah so now that isn't that Swiss is it Swiss okay well they speak French there too don't they I believe so yeah I think they speak a number of languages like like many uh, European countries, they have more than one national language. So basically, basically what that's taught me, and again, I'm segueing a little bit, a little, but we'll come right back on track in a few moments, is that, mm. is that if I can extrapolate to the entire world, is that everything we see on the macro scale for, and, and in science too and in engineering seems to be very serious, right? But if you really dig down to the most fundamental constituents of what this is all founded on, it basically you find out it's all, everything is just basically founded on a layer of utter silliness that really is kind of masked by the seriousness that's laying on top of it. Um, anyway, at least when it comes to the antibiotic rifamycin and rifampicin. So there you go. Maybe, maybe some, maybe we've just, if, if nothing else, we've just provoked somebody to go watch Rafifi. Or, or started an international incident, one of the two. Yeah. Oops. That's all right. We do tend to do that, don't we, sometimes? Uh -huh. It's okay. We promise that we'll be on our best behave when we're in, um, when we're in Berlin in, uh, in March, won't we, Oliver? For the yeah. uh, un undoing age in 2019 at the end of March. Hopefully, yeah. we'll be there and we'll definitely be on our best behavior. Sure. Until until a few drinks, then, then all bits are off. Yeah. No comment. <laughs> okay. So, um, so there you go. There's, there's your little bit of silly trivia right there. Um, uh, okay. So, so these, these drugs, when they look at, uh, you know, and here's basically figure five, three drug synergies increase MUFAs and medium chain TAGs. So I'm not gonna really go through this in too much detail. This is kind of their schematic pathway. So SBP1 being the master regula regulatory transcriptional factor that turns on all this stuff. 
and this is what these genes do and you know and this is basically so here's your single mono unsaturated fatty acid and here's your poly unsaturated fat your mufas and your pufas <laughs> uh, so they actually look at the mufa pufa ratio and i'm not making this up um and if oh, come you on you're killing me here I'm serious. If your mufa pufa ratio is high, then that's a good thing. Mufa um, pufa. Yeah. So, so basically, you want to have more mufas relative to your pufas, and if, and that's the way you do it is by doing the hokey pokey. No, by upregulating SPP one. So, um, and this and this is. <laughs> uh, God. All right. Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> All right, let's go back. Hey, I didn't name these. <laughs> I'm just reading what's on the on the screen. Okay. Um, okay, so if you have uh, Let's take a look at the screen. So um, again, so if they look at full change of, of these uh, monounsaturated fatty acids, uh, they go up, right? So um, these are in different drug combinations. Um, really, I kind of want to, and again, this is again, they look at the downstream components that are, you know, relative messenger RNA expression of the genes that are required for the formation of these monounsaturated fatty acids. And, you know, and Again, these go up in response to these drug combinations. I just want to skip again. I mentioned early in the paper that really we should start with figure seven because that's really, really what we care about. Figure seven, RIF plus Sora plus Allen and RAP plus RIF plus Allen improve health span and performance, right? Boom. That's, um, do these drug combinations have an effect? And I'm going to do a little rant here and basically say that, uh, you know, I think it comes down also to my view of, of, biomarkers of aging. Um, to me, the best biomarker of aging is uh, physiologic performance and health span, right? Um, yes, we need, we need molecular biomarkers of aging to figure out, you know, how, you know, longevity pathways impact aging. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, um, patients themselves, and when I say patients, maybe I shouldn't use the word patients because we're all going to, we're all aging, right? Um, Really, we care about health span. I mean, you know, fundamentally for the person that's going to be taking these drug combinations, it doesn't matter if your methylome looks robust and healthy and that of a, you know, an Olympian who's in, in his or her 20s or 30s, if you feel like crap and can't walk up a flight of stairs, right? So uh, really the correlation should be the other way around. So, you know, um, so... Uh, I mentioned this because there's a lot there, you know, we had a project that we funded, which is basically doing just that, trying to come up with a, a means to measure um, physiologic response and correlate that with chronological and biological aging of humans. And this is the age scan project. And, you know, and, um, you know, I just want to say that, you know, a lot of people might think that it's kind of like a higher order, you know, um, higher order biomarker, you know, versus something that is kind of a bit sexier where you're talking about epigenome status changes, right? Which is, which is um, necessary and important, especially when you're, you're basically trying to look at the mechanisms involved, but you need, you need, you need to connect both, right? You need, you need to connect both. I mean, if, if everything that we're saying about longevity pathways and aging is correct, then the higher order biomarkers that are basically physiologic response that is you know your real biological age and your performance should match the molecular you know um, uh, fingerprints of of what you're basically trying to tease apart right so if you've got them if you got them you know epigenetic status of somebody who's healthy then you should really be healthy right and those two should should match and if they don't match then something is off by one of your measurements or the other. So that's, that's my spiel. And that's what they look at really kind of at the end here. So after all of, um, you know, after all of these kind of uh, lifespan assays, which are, you're, you're really, you know, that's, this is your kind of your, um, the most important assay that you could do for these organisms. 
they go ahead and, you know, and, and after looking at the lipid profiles and so on and so forth, they look at really the health span. And by health span, they look at the kind of the physiology of the worms, right? Uh, how, how fast do they wriggle, right? And how long do they wriggle? And how many eggs do they lay? And that sort of thing, which uh, is, is important. So I'll share the screen here. And um, the bottom line is they do pretty well. Um, which is really what we want to see in here. So the combinations that had the most synergistic effects, Rifampicin, Sora, and Allen, and Rap, Rif, and Allen, um, they do a number of assays. Uh, they look at number of progeny, so number of eggs these things lay. Um, and this is your control. Um, what's interesting is that, um, you know, there are, when, when you look at, you know, drugs and you look at mutations that extend lifespan, there's always a trade-off, right? There's, there's going to be evolutionary trade-offs. There's a reason why these things were not selected for, right? If, you know, people have to remember that evolution doesn't work in a vacuum, right? You don't, you don't evolve in a protective environment. You evolve in the environment that you have, which is a harsh, ever-changing environment. So the most important genes, the most important um, traits that are going to be selected are the ones that are going to enable you to reproduce the best and to survive the longest in an ever-changing environment. That doesn't mean that your somatic tissue is going to live the longest. It means that you're going to maintain progeny longer than, than your competitor will. Um, so there's going to be trade-offs, right? And, um, and usually there is some trade-off. So if you, you know, if you slow down the metabolic rate of an organism, you, you know, reduce the reactive oxidative of species, you do a lot of things where in a protective environment, okay, it's fine. But in an environment where you basically have to pummel your competitor and snatch food and run, you know, run like all heck to get away from something, um, having reduced metabolic efficiency is probably not going to help you out in that scenario, or maybe not metabolic efficiency, having a too efficient metabolism, but having you, you know, be slower, or as a consequence, not reproduce as much, is in the long run, is not going to be good for the population of that species, right? Maybe, maybe good for you in some sort of cave, but not, not good in, in the long run. And, and that's basically what we see is, 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 um, is that output and that's you know so you have you have many different selective pressures so it's interesting to see here is that um the kind of early you know number of progeny goes down it appears with these drug combinations so there is some trade-off but it's actually extended or you know so you kind of you know it's 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 kind of interesting to see that the reproductive reproductivity overall is depressed but um the organisms could lay eggs for longer than your than your um, control animals, right? So, um, uh, so you know the trade-offs seem to be a bit, you know, very slight and negligible. Um, and again, um, why didn't this evolve if it appeared to be such a slight effect? You know, these mutations and give the worm some added days. Again, it's, you know, all of these responses are integrated over many, 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 many generations and millions of years. So even a very slight detrimental effect in egg laying that you can't really notice or tell, tell right now um, will, you know, um, add up over a long period of time, right? Um, but everything else physiologically, these worms seem pretty well. So they, they do these, they don't just look do a, an assay, a longevity, a lifespan assay, but they look at health span. And by health span, basically we mean, okay, the worms live longer, but do they move like a young worm should move for longer, right? While they're living longer. And the answer is, yeah. So they look at these different movements, sinusoidal movement, which I guess is how the worm wriggles. So C. elegans, if you look at under a microscope, they kind of slither around, kind of that's where the name elegance comes from. It's kind of a, this very sinusoidally, you know, symmetrical movement, um, which may be creepy to some, I guess. Um, and then there's this non-sinusoidal movement, but which I guess the worm is just sort of thrashing about. Um, and then head to tail, head tail movement. So some sort of movement, right? So 
So you could see that this, this, uh, you know, everything is shifted towards towards the right, right? So, so you have more of this movement, um, and then they check check the worms for kind of robustness of, you know, be, to insults. Um, and what do they look at here? I think they look at heat shock, heat resistance to heat stress, resistance to paraquat induced oxidative stress. Paraquat is this um, um, used to be used as an herbicide. Um, I believe of all things, it used to be used to wipe out marijuana plantations back in the Nixon administration. We used to, back in the day when our military would crop dust countries like Vietnam, that was, that was the thing. Um, so about Agent Orange then? A Agent Orange. Um, they the, the logo of the squadrons, they used to fly over Vietnam and dump all these toxins and, and wipe out all the ecosystems and forests was, um, it was a, kind of a dark spin-off of remember um uh, was it uh, Smokey the bear or the, that was uh, only you can prevent forest fires so we had this bear that basically was a logo of our national parks which basically um you know he would he would caution campers not to not to you know to put out their put out their campfires so they wouldn't like set yellowstone up in flames and we end the commercial by going only you can prevent forest fires uh well the logos of the squadrons were only we prevent forests. <laughs> so pretty dark, but anyway. Um, so paraquat. Um, so the worms uh, are, you know, so control is black. So you could see over time hours that, you know, these worms with these drug combinations are doing much better. The basal metabolic rate is actually um, better for longer. Um, development measured by size of worms. So over a period of uh, days, the, size does not decrease they you know they're they're about the same size um they travel more right so these worms are go-getters they're they're out and about looking for jobs doing whatever the worms do um so these drug combinations you know uh are doing you know pretty pretty uh pretty wonderful things um so i don't know there's um there's a lot to be said for this, there's this approach. Um, I'm just gonna add kind of one thing since this is Halloween and um, I know something uh, that you don't, Steve, is that uh, remember we were talking about naked mole, mats, mole rats and their high length, high chain um, hyaluronic acids, right? So there was a study, there was a human study where they actually injected humans with this stuff. And they had some really interesting results, but wasn't as expected. So here's one of the um, participants, pretty turned into a nerve naked mole rat. So happy Halloween. Oh, good grief. Oh, good grief. <laughs> so you've been playing uh, Fallout. You've been playing the Fallout games too much with those giant, uh, those giant mole rats. <laughs> I hope nobody freaked out. That's actually, I got this from Miranda, Miranda Jory from Deviant Art. So somebody actually made a naked mole rat mask. Um, and um, yeah, so um, no, nobody actually um, did that. And I, I, I hopefully that would not be the, the, the that wouldn't be the result. You should have wore that. You should have wore that and done the journal club uh, dressed as a naked mole rat, and then that would have been funny. Uh, that would have been. Yeah, it's too short notice. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's as. Uh, you know that that is the most frightening looking. If I can imagine, uh, kind of like it's like Nosferatu, but much worse. Poor, poor naked mole rats. They get a um, they get a bad rap, uh, but they're actually kind of cute. Um, you know, in, in their own sort of unique way. It's not their fault they don't have hair, but they've, they've adapted um, to the subterranean tunnels uh, specifically for that reason. They don't have hair. So they, uh, I understand they're smooth and elastic, as uh, Vera Gubanova uh, recently said in an interview we published today. Apparently it's to facilitate the movement down the tunnels in which they live, which are like tight, sort of but uh, but fairly damp um, mm -hmm. tunnels so that makes sense you wouldn't want hair if you lived in that sort of environment would you no you certainly wouldn't and, so, and 
and and and uh, if you're going to be meeting things in dark tunnels, you you certainly want to look like that to frighten them away. Um, well, you know, like I say, the the the, the poor humble mole rat gets a bad rap, but uh, you know, I don't think they're that they're, they're hor horrible. You know. Have you actually worked with one up close and personal? I've seen them. Um, I don't think they're hideous. I mean, I've I've seen. Well, I haven't seen them actually in reality. Have you? Yeah, I've, I've seen mole rats. Yeah, and um, uh, what else have I seen? All sorts of things because you know I, I quite like rodents. I used to keep guinea pigs. Uh, a friend used to keep rats. We used to have rats in the house, and they used to run around and run up your arm and stuff. But they're very friendly. I mean, obviously domesticated rats. What else have I seen? I've seen meerkats. Hmm. Yeah, and they do do that thing where they stand there and they, you know, they, they look, look around. They do, That's they weird. do that, and there's usually a couple of them. And one's looking one way, and one's looking the other. And it, uh, I saw, I, I saw those uh, for real, and they, they do actually do that. So. You know, cat. I, I have two cats. Cats sometimes do that too. They get up on their hind legs and kind of look around, sort of. Mm. Not too frequently, but, um, but there's YouTube videos of some cats doing it quite frequently, and it is rather cute. Seeing a cat on two legs. Yeah, Look. cats are very intelligent. Yeah, I've got I've, I've got two cats myself. My my sister, when she was growing up uh, as a, as a kid, she she was into hamsters, mm. quite quite a lot into hamsters. Not a good mix, really. Uh, cats and hamsters, no, we didn't have them simultaneously. They were it was they were separate, um, and that's not a good mix because hamsters are also very creative in uh, escaping. Um, they actually have like these little, like rodents have little little hands, and they will actually they'll try to figure out where the, you know where the door is, and they will actually pick it up and 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 figure out which way it's supposed to go and get little leverage. So you have to actually wire those doors shut because they will grab it and they will lift oh, yes. it and get that hamsters. I've kept I've, I've I used to keep Roboroskis, uh, which are little uh, dwarf hamsters. Russian dwarf hamsters, good grief! They're like they're like tigers. <laughs> they bite your hand off. They're not very um, they're not very friendly. <laughs> they're fun to watch and gerbils, but you know, poor rodents. They get a bad rap, but they're not that bad. They're not that bad. Just yeah. avoid the dwarves. But mole rats, stop picking on them. All right. Well, it's Halloween, so you know, oh, why not? We're, I'm, I'm just picking on them for Halloween. Oh, that's all right. Because you know, I mean, let's face it. Uh, you know, in our in our in our anthropocentric anthropocentric viewpoints, they they are quite ugly, right? All the definitions of what we consider to not be attractive, and they seem to embody. Um, but but they, uh, are, but they are longevity superstars, and that that's what makes are, them very important. Right. So we basically mm. want to we 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 want to learn the essence of the mole rat. Without yeah. actually becoming a mole rat, we do, and one of the reasons they live so long is DNA repair. Um, mm -hmm. They have very efficient DNA repair, and um, and a very stable genome. This is a common theme among very long-lived animals uh, that they they tend to have that. You know, I'm beginning to think the hallmarks of aging might be right about genomic uh, instability. There, yeah. it's looking like a strong case really for it, but. You know that could be a primary cause of aging, um, and also, and also, and also, kind of to take the higher order of evolutionary, you know, vantage points that I mentioned before. I mean, when you when you actually do evolutionary biology, you know, you 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 can't can't neglect the environment, right? That's that's the other half. People talk about genes, 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 but it's it's natural selection, and you know, what is the natural? The natural is the environment. That's you know, you need to. You need to have selective pressure and um, organisms that have evolved to escape predation to be in safer environments either artificially in being kept in cages or you know us making cities and hospitals and so on and so forth um, or you know naturally through basically flight or living in tunnels like naked mole rats um, you know they tend to live longer than their evolutionary peers that are in much harsher environments, um, and you know, uh, are reproductively fit longer, and um, 
and you know, and that's kind of one of the uh, kind of the important takeaways that if you're a biologist that you just can't mm. overlook. Um, so if you want to look at genes that are responsible for preserving our somatic tissues, that's another kind of rich vein of, of, of searching to do is to look at evolutionarily related organisms that have evolved in distinct environments. Um, you know, for example, bats versus similarly sized rodents. I mean, that's, these are observations that have made for well before I was born where, you know, you have, you know, organisms that, in, that mm. fly in escape predation tend to live significantly longer by years than organisms they can't, right? So um, super stable environments seem to encourage longevity. For example, we obviously touched upon the mole rats, but also the Greenland shark, who's an absolute titan when it comes to longevity. What I mean, they, they think they're about 800 years plus. Yeah. I mean, that's astounding that there could be a shark out there that was alive before, well, before the United States even existed. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of freaky and there's whales out there. But when you think about it, <clears throat> typically speaking, pollution and all the mess we're making of the ocean, it is a super stable environment. So, you know, that, that may also explain uh, to a certain extent why they live so, so much longer because it's going to change the epigenetics, isn't it? It's going to, you know, uh, genomic and epigenetic stability equal... Um, uh, longevity and and we've kind of done that with technology and cities and potentially that's why we live a little bit longer because we're insulating ourselves from the environment we're no longer as vulnerable to the environment if you will as our uh, as our primitive ancestors who lived yeah. in caves yeah and of course and that and all of this all of this basically just lends credence to, you know, to uh, all these interventions that we're searching right now for to increase our health span and our lifespan. Um, you know, uh, aging itself, the rate of aging, longevity, longevity mechanisms are ex just like any other trait are, even though they're multifactorial, are still extremely malleable when it comes to environmental effects on the genome and selective pressure. Right? The fact that you can have these 800-year-old um, aquatic organisms or even longer uh, or organisms that are very evolutionarily similar but just have diverged in environment and their, their differences of maximal lifespan are an order of magnitude apart, you know, that tells you right there that, you know, that uh, it's, it's a very, you know, without any high technology interventions, you know, given the right selective environment and time, and enough reproductive cycles, you will select for longevity. Yeah, so, which, is, um, which has happened in the case of the mole rat. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and we know fundamentally, and it's almost certain now, that aging is only a finite amount of, uh, of processes or hallmarks. They're not, you know, there's not, a lot of people seem, the misconception is a lot of people think, oh, it's super complicated. It, 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 well, it is. Metabolism is very complicated. I mean, it's like a spaghetti, like a plate of spaghetti. But fundamentally, aging is only a finite amount of core fundamental processes. It's got yeah. to be. And, and, and I think, as you said before, about the unified theory of aging, you think is coming yeah. um, soon to a cinema near you. Um, I think we're honestly closing in on that. Yeah. And, and, and and our understanding, whilst not complete right now, is certainly enough to start interventions. That's why I find these combinational uh, studies so interesting, especially the ones that touched upon the uh, IGF-1 uh, pathway uh, earlier, because they directly relate to hallmarks of aging or core processes. And one, so, other, uh, one other tidbit I want to kind of, and this is my bias to put out there as somebody who's done research in this field and has been writing and reading a lot of papers and has been involved in it, um, is that I don't get hung up too much about uh, aging per se, but rather longevity mechanisms. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with aging, but the mechanisms I believe that are responsible for longevity are not so much, and they're very conserved. And just to kind of, kind of give a, uh, an example when it comes to machinery, there's many things that can go wrong with your car, but only so many ways that you can fix them. For example, you know, your car can, if you just take a look at the exhaust system, the types of damage that can happen through corrosion, through decomposition of the catalytic converter. I mean, 
you know, if you want to, if you want to characterize all the chemical changes that happen to the alloys, right? I mean, you could say, my God, this is so, so, so complicated. How am I ever going to change this muffler? <laughs> that, that you don't need to worry about that, right? If, I mean, you just change the muffler, right? And you change, change it for one that's, that's new. So that's not, to, that's not to say that all the things that go wrong shouldn't be studied, but I think there's a richer vein um, for studying the pathways and mechanisms that fix that or repair uh, or reset, you know, um, you know, cycles of aging and, 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 and prevent all of the kind of stochastic random things, basically, that can go wrong because, you know, the things can go wrong is nearly infinite, right? And, but you have a limited repertoire that you can do to actually fix these things. Um, and just to also kind of another things to, to throw out at, at our listeners here is that, um, you know, we, we as a species and every species that's sexual does this all the time, right? I mean, we're just, again, just to emphasize, we're talking about somatic tissue aging. That's what we are concerned about. Our germline is continuous, right? So uh, what we're trying to figure out here has already been figured out a long time ago to reset the germline when a baby is born and starts at zero, right? And, um, and even that, I think, is a rich vein um, to tap into when it comes to studies because it's not 100% clear, well, not, not clear at all, actually, what's happening. You could wave your hand and say, well, epigenetic changes happen when the sperm and the egg meet and the zygote forms, and that resets things to a youthful state. Okay, um, I'm sure there's lots of other things, um, but, you know, really, mathematically, there's, to me, you know, it still doesn't explain convincingly to me um, why a baby doesn't start at 30. Um, evolutionarily, we know why it won't start at 30, because your whole species would collapse after one or two generations. Um, but what is that mechanism that, that basically resets that clock, right? Because you're still dealing with two old cells, right? Two old cells, an old sperm and an old egg, right? They're still relatively old. So what happens, right? So, and, and, uh, so we have a lot of examples from nature where we're the resetting of the clock happens all the time, right? Otherwise, you, you, you wouldn't, you, you know, we wouldn't be, life is continuous, right? Just to sum it up, it's been continuously operating to the best of our knowledge without any interruptions, um, without any permanent interruptions. Obviously, the tree of life has been pruned because of mass extinctions, but supposedly it's been happening, it's been going on without interruptions, division after division from lower orders for about mm, 3.8 billion years, give or take, right? So life is pretty ancient and, you know, populations don't age, but individuals do. So I'm going to, you know, so it seems to be that aging is a individual phenomenon. It is not a population phenomenon, unless you do some kind of intervention that's radical like delete tel telomerase from a cell right then it's potentially a population phenomena but if it was a population phenomena then life would go extinct right done right if aging was you know, a population phenomena but it's not it's an individual phenomena so um so in in that grand sense um life is ageless life is ageless life is immortal life life that's, I can say that pretty firmly. Life with the lowercase l, individuals, is not. Um, and that's because evolution does not, the selective pressure does not work on individuals. Um, it, is it works on really populations. And individuals are then selected through this, you know, the, the, the selective pressure of whatever that environment is. Um, so in that sense, you know, the strategies every organism has evolved to give off progeny and keep going are successful. We're wildly successful. As a species, we've been around for millions of years, but we have grown very fond of our individual somatic tissues, which, you know, um, have not kept up. Um, and, you know, and, and we're not selected to, to keep up because of, you know, basically the, the vicissitudes of the environment in which we evolved, right? And, uh, I think right now we're at a turning point in our species history where we have altered our own environment actually for the, 
for the better. I know some people think we trash the environment, but uh, you know, we do that too. But when it comes from a health perspective, we are living a whole heck of a lot healthier and longer uh, as on the whole aggregate as a species than we ever have. Um, and you know, uh, my, my goal is to keep this trajectory going. Um, that's to me kind of the distillation of, of human progress. And, um, and I don't want to see it cut short arbitrarily because that would be a very brutish and short existence, which uh, we can easily find ourselves back in, in no time. Yeah, and studies like this are the key potentially to uh, unlock in that understanding and developing technologies and medicines that simply allow us to keep on rolling. So that's what we're here for. So, yeah. The ball's in air court, I suppose, um, because evolution isn't going to um, rush to sort anything out soon. So I suppose it's us and our mission to expedite that, right? Yeah. Elected evolution, or whatever people want to call it, whatever the buzzword is. Artificial selection. Yeah, or guided guided evolution, um, you know, those sorts of things. But yeah. Oh, 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 I got a word. Eugenics. Has that been used already? No. Oh, good grief. Don't say eugenics. Look, anytime anybody says eugenics, everybody gets the wrong idea and then everybody riots. So let, let's not use the word eugenics, although eugenics is a thing. Um, it's not what. Uh, it's not what the Nazis thought it was, but um, but there we are. But they Live weren't long. really. Mm. They, they weren't really into health and prosperity, so let's uh, <laughs> <sighs> let's leave them there. So on, on the whole, no, not really. At least not for everybody. Not really, no. So you think we can uh, we we can we can we can learn a great deal of things from combinational studies like this, or of. Well, uh, I've, I've, I've been saying it throughout this uh, paper. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I, anything, that, um, anything that expedites um, and improves our ability to predict combinations. Um, you, know, one, you know, one thing that I find very kind of tantalizing is that, you know, we might have a very good combination already out there, and we probably do. We just don't know it. It might be under our noses, you know, maybe... X micromoles of quercetin and X micromoles of metformin in combination with, you know, this and that are the magic key to boosting our health span by 40%, right? And I well, don't... I'm going to be a bit skeptical about 40%, but I mean, bring it on. Well, I said health span, maybe. I mean, could you know, certainly. Mm. I don't know. We don't know. The point is we don't know, but this paper certainly lays the groundwork for, um, for figuring this out. And um, I would be really in, intrigued to see, you know, because right now what they did was sort of do a very, you know, a very um, thorough approach, but I'm not gonna say haphazard, but basically they looked, they did a lot of thinking and reasoning and they looked through a lot of databases and they put together a lot of pieces of the puzzle. And I'm just wondering if there could be some sort of bunch of mathematicians and programmers can't come up with uh, can't come up with some AI algorithm that can basically do what these researchers did and basically say okay this is our best mm. selection of a dozen combinations for a human trial right based on mm. based on a similar approach with these or approaches that these authors have done right which is basically scour through a multitude of databases you know then apply you know, drugs from those databases and then look at transcriptome profiles and then do analyses to see overlap, you know, and orthologous pathways. And then, you know, and, and do this kind of iterative approach where you use bioinformatics or multiple tools and databases from bioinformatics. Um, it seems to me that, that, that you know, um, to me, artificial intelligence is just a buzzword because I don't, I'm, I don't practice in this field. I don't know the first thing about neural networks and, and AI. But it seems that this is the type of um, uh, the type of application that would be uh, really, really um, beneficial and fruitful if there's a bunch of smart folks out there 
that uh, can design such a system to, to kind of look for these types of combinations. And uh, hopefully they're listening in right now and, uh, you know, uh, and run with this idea. Yeah, so you, you hear that, Alex? Get that sorted out. He, know, he knows who he is. But anyway, but the, but there certainly are, um, there are certainly uh, AI, AI uh, deep learning applications uh, and, and things in development platforms that can sift through vast libraries and potentially look at combinational um, studies. I, I, I think it's probably the only way ahead uh, because it's, it, it, it gets to the point where it's becoming, it's so complicated it would take far too long for humans to sit there and work it all out. Whereas upon a, uh, a deep learning system or matrix or whatever you want to call it would, would sit there and go, Oh yeah, yeah, there you go. And then, you know, it's like they do it in like a few hours if that. So I think that's where AI is going to become particularly useful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cause whenever you say AI, everybody sort of thinks I can't allow you to do that. You know, like how, 5,000 from Space Odyssey. But the reality is uh, AI is more, is more a, a tool uh, allowing sifting of, of drug catalogs and libraries and, 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 and putting together all the pieces. That's what AI is really doing. It's not, it's not taking over the world or, or the space station or pushing people out of the airlock or anything like that. Well, at least AI as it's practiced now, very discreetly directed towards um, or, or, or directed towards very discrete problems that we need answering rather than rather than directed towards a vague and broad problem such as um, AI um, make society perfect. You probably don't want to ask AI that question. I can't allow you to do that, Oliver. <laughs> No, you know, there, there's a horror story. There's a horror story, a techno horror story for Halloween. So, yeah, it's all very frightening. Um, so let's not go there and let's just focus on the uh, the one horror story that we all want to get rid of. And that is aging. Because I think that's personally the most scary horror story anybody could uh, think of. Yeah. Yep. And all the effects thereof. Anyway, well, Thanks, everybody. Yeah. I'm sorry about the rambling, but it is Halloween and we're, we're in that kind of gregarious mood today. So hopefully you've, you've filtered through and taken back some useful knowledge here. I think, we, I think we had some knowledge nuggets in there somewhere, right, Oliver? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we dropped some, I dropped some trivia tidbits that, uh, you know, anyway, there's something for everyone. You want science, you have science. If you want something that maybe you could mention to your colleague in the bar um then you've got that too hopefully it's science but uh but if not then it's and it's, the, it's the, a picture it's a picture of a guy who looks like a naked mole rat exactly evidence that the, the mole people are really here yeah so if that doesn't uh, keep you awake at night thinking about that then i don't know what will and and that's that's great so i presume we'll be back sort of same time ish next month for another journal club Backed by popular demand, or more specifically, people haven't asked us to be taken off the air yet. So I'm assuming we're doing a good job, or a reasonable job. Who 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 can say? And um, we'll be back with another entertaining paper, possibly that one about analytics and Alzheimer's, maybe yeah. that we were, mm -hmm. we were we were thinking about. So yeah. we'll come up with something anyway. And of course, if you do have a suggestion of a paper that you'd like us to have a look at. Send it along to us, get in touch, email us, and let us know if you've seen something interesting. Because we can't be everywhere at once, unfortunately. So sometimes even we miss the odd paper or two. And that's it. We'll be back next time. Um, if you want to keep up with the latest news uh, in aging research, if you want to uh, check us out, uh, visit uh, www.lifespan.io forward slash blog. And that will keep you up to date with the latest goings on. And also, uh, if you do like what we do and you'd like to support us uh, more directly, if you, you'd like to consider becoming a Patreon, or what, as we call them, uh, Lifespan Heroes, you can check that, check that out at www.lifespan.io forward slash hero. And I'm going to finally uh, mention that we are just wrapping up the last three days on a campaign that we're hosting a project for Harvard Medical School. Uh, working with them and um, it's all about NMN 
which is uh, a lifespan study. Today, we actually smashed the uh, final uh, fundraising goal. But spoiler alert, we may be announcing a new stretch goal very shortly, maybe. So uh, do check that out if you're interested um, in some of the cool, funky stuff that you can get for supporting the project. Anyway, that's at www.lifespan.io forward slash n m n and i think that's about it so we'll see you next time and thanks for joining us everybody and we're glad that you enjoyed our uh, halloween special thanks guys so we'll see you next time <laughs>